What's going on, everyone? Welcome back. My name is Stacey Jewell, and this is the Bejeweled podcast where we bestow gems of truth on humanity. Today, we are joined by author and documentary filmmaker Robert Bonomo. Robert taught as a lecturer in the English department of the Loyang Institute of Science and Technology. During Robert's time in Loyang, he had the unique opportunity of interacting with several Taoist monks who exercised a very strong influence on him and his desire to make this film by helping to understand the universal nature of esoteric thought. The documentary was birthed out of his novel, Your Love Incomplete, and we are here today to talk about all things tarot and divination. Robert, welcome to Bejeweled. Thanks a lot for having me on. Really looking forward to it. Yes, I'm so excited to talk to you. So I like to jump into these with kind of just having the audience learn a little bit about your background. So how did you uh, be begin pursuing these topics? How did they become part of your life? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it really came, the strong part of it came when I was writing a novel, You're Loving Complete, and I was looking for a structure for the novel. So I just mm -hmm. focused on the major arcana of the tarot. Mm-hmm. But before that, I had always had an interest in Jungian psychology. I had my astrology uh, chart read by a wonderful astrologer. And uh, it kind of opened my eyes to, you know, there's something going on here. Mm -hmm. And I think sometimes when you hit like your late 30s, early 40s, you're sort of open to different things. So I had some experiences in that period. And that, I think all of that together. And I never forget the moment where I realized I can't just use the major arcana sort of in a light way to try and use it as a, a narrative structure. I have to understand it. Mm -hmm. And these rabbit holes, you know, some rabbit holes go down for a week, a month. This one, <laughs> I think it's a lifelong pursuit. <laughs> mm -hmm. For sure. For sure. So what, what age would you say you were when you, you kind of started opening up yourself to this and learning about, had, had you been into tarot like earlier or it was all new? Yeah. I mean, I had, I had had a couple decks and I had kind mm -hmm. of played around with them, but mm -hmm. not in any kind of a serious way. Mm -hmm. I would say around 40. Yeah. Yeah. So about, you know, I'm what, almost 52 now. So about mm -hmm. 12 years ago was when I really kind of dove in. Mm -hmm. And, and it Robert, takes a couple of years. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. It's, um, I have, I just recently bought the, uh, the Rider Weight. And I'll tell you, it's a little daunting um, trying to figure all of it out. And and I'm I'm researching it for from like an educational perspective, sure. not even so much on the, the spiritual realm, because I just I want to learn it um, from more of the structured learning. So mm -hmm. it's it's daunting to pick out those cards and see those cards and try to figure out what they mean. I mean, you have a booklet, but what does the booklet really tell you? That seems like the things are counterintuitive, like, you know, I... <laughs> I, when I play around with them, I feel like I get the tower card every time. And I'm like, what is, what is happening? Like, why do I get this? <laughs> you keep getting the tower card. Yes. Yeah, you like, know what that means? Time. No, I don't. <laughs> that means that your old structures are collapsing. And that's your old belief systems are, are yes. just caving in. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful thing about that, I, I don't know if you remember in my film, mm -hmm. the end of the tarot card of the uh, tower card, you see Liberty Tower emerge. It's mm -hmm. an alchemic furnace. Mm -hmm. You take the two towers, mm -hmm. they collapse, and a new one arises. Yes. Remember, the card after the tower card is the star. Yes. So you, once, you, once you get to her, you're, you're all right. That's awesome. I love <laughs> it. Well, so let's, let's jump into that. So I was telling you a little bit offline that um, it was because 21 Faces of God that I discovered um, that I even began to even think about this. Like tarot was never a part of my life before. Um, actually, you know, growing up um, very, very Christian, it's actually kind of, you're kind of steered away from those yeah, kind of things. Definitely. So and I just kind of had a, a really basic understanding that these are cards and I shouldn't play with them. That's kind of how I grew up thinking. And, um, so it's when I watched your YouTube and I actually heard you on Greg Carlwood's show. That's how I even came right. across it. Mm -hmm. The second I got done listening to your talk with him, I jumped on YouTube and I watched the documentary and it was so fascinating to me, um, because this is, this is for certain old world, um, knowledge and, mm. and I love history and all that kind of stuff. So it really a, a, appealed to me. Um, so with all that saying, it was your documentary that even put me down this path. So why don't you tell us a little about lit, a little bit about 21 faces of God and how, how the documentary came to be? 
Sure. But first, a, a shout out to Greg. I love that show. Yes. The Higher Side Chats. He's such He's a cool awesome. guy. He is. And his audience is fantastic. So yes. you know, I'm really glad you came through through him. He's a great yes, guy. He is. Um, so the film. Now, it's interesting. I come from a very, uh, well, Catholic background. Very strong Catholic background. And I had the same reaction to you. The first time I saw the cards, they scared the daylights out of me. Mm -hmm. I was like, ooh, this is exorcist stuff. My head's going to start spinning. Mm -hmm. And that's what's probably going on with you with the tower card. But <laughs> what I what what I look at the cards, especially in the Major Arcana, you can use the cards for divination. Mm -hmm. You can use the cards to play a game. Mm -hmm. But if we think of the three levels, the body, the soul, and the spirit, Mm -hmm. You could say this a little bit like the body is the cards as a game. The soul is are the cards as a divination, a tool mm -hmm. of divination to connect us to other things. But on a higher realm, there's a meaning behind them, and there's mm -hmm. a path. Mm -hmm. And that path is based on sort of the eternal wisdom mm -hmm. of, and these are mostly Greek ideas. Mm-hmm. And if you look at Christianity from the Greek point of view, that's why I think if you'll see in the film, I, I put there's quite a bit, not a lot, but there is some Christianity in the film also. It's mm -hmm. not an anti-Christian film at all. Correct. And just one thing that most people should remember, the last card of the tarot, the world, you know, that's that's a very famous image of Jesus mm -hmm. with the Pesach of Pisces and the four Gospels. Yep. They just changed it. Because they didn't want to have problems with the church. Mm -hmm. But the last card, when you reach that last realm, that's Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. But not in a fundamentalist way or a literalist way, in, in a, a transcendental way. Correct. So if you, it's not, there's re, there really is absolutely nothing anti-Christian at all. And in fact, the, the cards emerge from medieval Europe, which is just full of Christian thought. So mm -hmm. I understand people who, who come from that that background, but there really is nothing to be afraid of. However, there are people who use them maybe in ways that might not be, you know, appealing to Christians. And I, and I get that and I understand that, but fundamentally the meaning behind the, the major arcana is a path to awakening mm -hmm. or in a Christian sense, a path to Christ consciousness. Mm -hmm. And that's what they're showing. And when I understood that, I realized the best way to do this, I could write a book, mm -hmm but there are plenty of books on the tarot, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure anyone's ever made a film quite like the one I made. Mm -hmm. So I thought this is a great opportunity to show the path, but not explain it as much as allow people to feel it mm -hmm. through music, film, art, etc. And that's yes. really what I wanted to do. I wanted, I wanted to get across the experience of awakening, but not in, 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 in a way that, that was transmitted through powerful aesthetic experience mm -hmm. and that, that's and really I, what the film was about and i loved that about the film um i think it took a subject in my opinion that's pretty complex um probably not hard if you spend time researching it but complex to say the least and you presented it in a way in which that i could understand in a way that uh, intrigued me to learn more and that's what i really loved about the documentary um and it, i mean it really put me down a path I never expected to be on. And it was because of this documentary. So I was so excited uh, that you you came on the podcast because it had such an impact on my life. And I wanted to tell you that. Um, and I think it would have a lot of impact on my listeners' lives as well. Um, because like I said, you know, I, in this spiritual awakening um, journey, it's funny because all of these beliefs that we once had, like, seem to just kind of die or they become different. Like, exactly like what you said with the tower card. Because, you know, my beliefs were for before were these are cards and they're evil. Well, can a card be evil? No, I don't really think a card can be <laughs> yeah. evil. I think human intent can be evil sure. or things like that. But, you know, I started to see things as these are tools. Um, the same thing with reading your horoscope, the same thing with using oracle cards, whatever the case may be. But these are all tools. And I mean, for me personally, I don't live and die by anything. So something's not going to change me with the wind. I want to be steady. And when I realized that my perspective about things change. So tell us a little bit how about your book and what what the, how this came from the book. 
Yeah, because the when I, when I was writing, I wanted to write um, an esoteric novel. There, there was a genre in like the early twentieth century of some people call it esoteric pulp. Mm-hmm. They're almost like the these novels of these people who have these weird experiences and they meet a brotherhood yeah. of enlightened people. There's many novels out there, mm-hmm. but for, for the early the nineteen twenties, there are many of them. So I wanted to write sort of a neo version of that. Mm-hmm. Starting with a character who works for a um, kind of like a pyramid scheme. Mm-hmm. And if you'll notice, a lot of pyramid schemes use lots of esoteric and religious methodology to yeah. suck people in. For God's sakes, it's called a pyramid scheme. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You know what I mean? And, and so it, it goes from someone who's kind of in a pyramid scheme marketing all the way through that path of the cards. Mm -hmm. So the deeper I got into the cards, the more I understood that that's what the novel was about. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so it, 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 it's an, I think it, I think the, I would think what's interesting about the book is if you understand the major arcana, you can see how each chapter is sort of dealing with each card. Mm -hmm. So you sort of, it has a theme. Each chapter has a theme, but there's a, it's a pretty straight, clear narrative path Mm -hmm. of somebody going through those different aspects in life and the different, you know, the different stages. I love that. So you took a real life example and you applied the cards basically to that person's life. So it wasn't, exactly. you're not just reading, it's something you can relate to. I exactly. love that. Yeah. So how, do, how does somebody get into tarot in terms of, of learning? Well, I mean, what, where do you start when you see all those cards and you get overwhelmed? Yeah, I would separate, I would immediately, I would, okay, this, I, I think I would personally, if you don't, under, know a lot about the cards by the Rider Weight deck mm-hmm. for a couple of reasons. One, because the pips, the minor arcana, have pictures. Mm-hmm. And it's so much easier, I think, to memorize the cards when there's a picture. Yes. So you want to separate the cards into the major and the minor. Mm-hmm. Put the minor aside, lay out the 22 major arcana mm-hmm. from leave the fool on top mm-hmm. and then go magician to chariot strength to temperance and the devil to the world three mm-hmm. layers three lines mm-hmm. those are the three levels mm-hmm. the material level the psychic level and the spiritual level and you want to understand those cards extremely well mm-hmm. learn those 22 major arcana mm-hmm. really understand them and there my film can really help mm-hmm. and you can find different books but on the major arcana the film can help mm-hmm. Once you understand those cards, then I would lay out the four suits, right? Mm -hmm. So the the, the masculine, uh, wands and swords, and then the feminine, cups and uh, pentacles, Mm -hmm. in order, without the court cards. Leave the court cards aside and just memorize those 10 cards. Okay. And there's lots of books. Just memorize them. And remember, we're in the elements. Focus on the element. Okay. Wands is fire. Cups is water. You really want to associate those and then add on the court cards, the four court cards for each okay. suit. I use the court cards as people. Mm-hmm. When I'm doing a reading, that's generally people. Okay. That's a pretty good way to do it. And then I would stick to the Celtic cross, learn one spread. Mm-hmm. Be- and I, I highly recommend that you don't, at least in the beginning, worry about upside, the difference in meaning being up, upside yes. down and, don't worry about that. There's enough variables. If you have any fans of math out there, if we have 78 cards and 10 positions, mm-hmm. it's something like 7 million different uh, variations on that. That's yes. enough. That's enough <laughs> to stop worrying about if the card is up or down. Yes. You know, so <laughs> I, I, that's how I would do it. And learn one spread. Because remember, once you understand the cards mm-hmm. and you understand the meaning of each position, Mm-hmm. Then it's the card, the question, and the position, <laughs> mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So it gets complicated. It does, and that's the that was the hard part for me. Um, and you know, I'm an analyst by trade, so I deal with math every day. And so I just I started figuring all this stuff out. I'm like, and then I got them where a couple of them were upside down. And I'm like, oh, I can't. Like this is no, too much. No, don't worry about <laughs> that. <yeah. laughs> like, what does that mean? Yeah. So um, I noticed one thing, and this this may come with understanding wisdom may come with understanding but what do you say to somebody that's kind of naturally pragmatic and they tend Mm -hmm. to look at cards and they tend to think the worst what do you say to somebody about that 
think the worst in the sense of doing a reading. Like the the absolute worst way that that card could go for somebody's life. What do you do if like that's somebody's thought path? Is there t- they're t- typically thinking, oh, this is going to mean the worst thing for my life. Like, how do you get somebody off of that? Because like you said, the tower card looks scary, but it may it, not it, be scary. Well, the tower card's pretty scary. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm not Mr. New Age. I mean, if you watch the film, uh, you've watched the film, yeah. you know, there's, I'm not, I'm not, mis- I'm not a New Age. I'm nothing against the New Age. I don't, yeah. I really don't have anything, but that's not where I come from. Yeah. And I come from more of a traditional, classic Greek kind of interpretation. The Greeks were pretty pessimistic. Yeah. And yeah. life's, you know, life ends badly for most of us. <laughs> so here's what I would say, though. Be extremely careful with the question you ask. Mm. I really, really don't like to do open-ended questions. Mm-hmm. I much prefer, and I really push people into this, mm-hmm. ask about a dilemma. Okay. So, for example, imagine someone comes to you and says, I'd like a reading. Okay, tell me what's going to happen in my life. I, I almost will never do that reading. Because, like you said, mm-hmm. you can get a horrible reading. Mm-hmm. And in a, re- a card, you know, the, for example, the Ten of Swords mm-hmm. in the final position, in the Ten position, there is nothing good about that. Yeah. So I don't want someone coming to me. I never want to do a reading that harms somebody. Mm-hmm. So one, I never do health questions mm-hmm. because there's psychosomatic effects. And yes, you can make yourself I, I, sick. You can make yourself sick. You make other mm-hmm. people sick. I highly recommend don't do health readings because you could really hurt somebody. Mm-hmm. Um, don't read for yourself. Mm-hmm. This is a hard one. Yeah. It's hard because a lot of people like to read for themselves. Mm-hmm. When you read for yourself, your ego is getting involved. Yeah. And people who who people who who do this a lot understand if you really want something, it, wanting something, desiring something, mm-hmm. think about eros, mm-hmm. how powerful that can be in a person. Yep. Everyone we're extremely attracted to is not necessarily someone we should be with. Yes. <laughs> heard <laughs> i think there i think we all agree on that so what i mean is when you really want something it can affect the reading that's mm-hmm. why re- I, readings the best readings are someone who has a true dilemma mm-hmm. i really don't know them mm-hmm. i don't ask a whole lot of background i usually ask for a little bit on their uh, astrology background mm-hmm. i like to take a look at their chart quick look at their chart and then the the, the ideal question is look for example I have two jobs, one in Chicago and one in L.A. I really don't know what to do. Mm -hmm. And it's really affecting them. That's when the cards can really help. Mm -hmm. But just to say, you know, I'm waking up today. You know, how's my day going to go? I I, I don't recommend that. Now, some people will pull a card as the theme of the day. Mm. That's completely different. That's that's just a way to sort of engage in in the engage in the mystical in the wonder of life that that I totally understand and I think is great mm-hmm. but don't look to predict you know what I mean don't look for trouble because mm-hmm. the cards will give you trouble if you ask for it yeah I mean pretty much with anything in life I think that's yeah. that's true and that's that's funny you know I, I think it's funny that we talked about the tarot or not the tarot card the tower card um because let me ask you this in tarot if something is a continual theme in your life so for example I'm I'm going through big changes right now, conscious wise, because of the path that I'm on. So do you think that that card will keep showing up in my path because it's reminding me that I'm transforming? What, like, what does that mean if it keeps coming? Good question. <laughs> There's an easy way to answer this question with the woo woo. Oh, yes, it's appearing because blah, blah, blah. just well, whatever the cards are telling you, pay attention. Mm-hmm. Because remember, okay. when 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 the when the wonder in life, when you allow the wonder in life to kind of seep in, mm-hmm. you'll see synchronicities begin to happen. Yes, and and that doesn't mean everything is a synchronicity, but it's a meaningful coincidence. A mm-hmm. causal, it's a causal, but it's a meaningful coincidence. Pay attention to those things. Mm-hmm. And I just jumped on the tower because it, it's interesting that you're getting involved in the cards and the tower and you talked about a Christian background, mm-hmm. you know, but one beautiful thing about, I, I don't want to harp on this, but it is true. 
people who come from deeply religious backgrounds mm -hmm. usually never reach their full spiritual potential until they disconnect completely from that tradition and then come back. Yes. The coming back is really beautiful because you come back and you see and you go, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. How didn't I see this before? But it's very hard to get there before you leave. Mm -hmm. And remember the dark night of the soul? Yes. That's when you lose faith. Yep. Unfortunately, that usually has to happen before you can actually understand your own tradition. Mm -hmm. that's, that's why it's so yeah. easy to understand other people's traditions, not your own. <laughs> yes, that's so true. Yeah. It's like the prodigal son. And, you know, that's, that's funny. I was having a, a long talk with my mom the other day about it. Um, and basically, you know, we were just having a conversation of, of where I'm at spiritually. And I mean, right now where I stand is I believe in a source. I believe in a creator what, you know, people call that creator, different things. And I have a, the biggest problem that I have is the people involved in religion, not so much the religion itself. I think the Bible teaches great things. I think Jesus was a great person, things like that, but it's the people that are involved in church and whatever, whatever denomination you are, that, that to me is where the turnoff really comes with that. Yeah. And that's why I'm just like, you know what? I don't, want to deal with all this crap like let's just get back to basics and that, it reminded me of that when you were telling about how you kind of have to leave to be able to come back and appreciate remember william james um the psych the great psychologist mm -hmm. no he had a wonderful quote and he said religion is believing in someone else's spiritual experience mm -hmm. and if anyone that. hasn't read if you haven't read the, his book the variety of um the variety of spiritual experience, mm -hmm. I believe it's not religious. That's a fabulous book, but she goes through people who've had powerful spiritual experiences. Mm -hmm. The idea of belief mm -hmm. that somebody else had this transcendent experience, and by believing in that experience, you will transcend. Mm -hmm. You've got to do it yourself. Yes. Yes. And you know, that's the problem with people in dogmatic religion. They they believe they believe in the menu, mm -hmm. but they don't actually eat the food. Yes. You go to the restaurant not to read the menu. You go to the restaurant to eat with, you know, what's on the menu, not the menu that's, itself. That's and so eating true. the menu is, you know, believing in certain narratives that you, you know what I mean, certain mm -hmm. texts and et cetera, et cetera. I completely agree. You know, and I have a friend that um, that he's agnostic, and he says something that that I actually subscribe to. And um, he he says religion is opiate for the masses, and yeah. I think that religion does a lot of good things for people. But I mean, for me, I just I started to find myself going to services and getting angry. Like getting angry in the services, I'm like, well, this is having the opposite effect of what it's supposed to be doing. And that's when I just decided, you know what? I don't think that this is for me. And that's when um, that's when my awakening experience happened probably about a year and a half ago. And it's been a it's been a roller coaster. It's been awesome. I would never go back um, to how I was before. But it's it's a lot. It's a lot to be to not just be blindsided to the things of the world, to be seeing synchronicities and all sorts of things all over the place. It's a little overwhelming at times. But it's a beautiful experience. And it don't is. worry. Don't don't worry. One, you eventually will come back, mm -hmm. but you'll come back and you'll see it in a completely different way. That's awesome. And and I really think that you'll come back and, and you'll see that, that whatever the whatever the tradition is or you'll see the value in it mm -hmm. for the people who are getting some value for it. You know, mm -hmm. I love so, that. yeah. But it, it is, you do have to, you have to say goodbye for a while at least. <laughs> yep. Yep. You got to find yourself at some point or another. Yeah. Well, let's talk about your influences because I know that a lot of the stuff in your past is what really actually was the catalyst for all this for you. Right. So sure. what were some of your biggest influences? I think one of the biggest was uh, Carl Jung, mm -hmm. the psychologist. So I started reading him when I was in my teens. Mm hmm. You know, the, the initial books. And it was he's one of those, you know, the early young and the late young. Mm -hmm. I didn't understand like the Mysterium or Aeon, those books, until I was like in my probably mid 40s. Mm -hmm. So he his his teaching, because he's really a mystic mm -hmm. masquerading as a psychiatrist. Mm -hmm. He used psychiatry to reach a mainstream 
academic, respected audience. But what he's really doing, he's he's a he's a true mystic. I would I would say his work is was an enormous influence on me. Mm-hmm. The ideas of the archetypes, etc. Terence McKenna is somebody else. Are you familiar with Terence McKenna? No, McKenna? I'm not. I'll have to look into it. Yeah, Terence McKenna. It was somebody. Now Terence McKenna used you know a psychonaut, so he used lots of uh, psychedelic drugs and things. Mm-hmm. And you know that's another thing where a lot of people are terrified of of those experiences, mm-hmm. but. You know, like he used to say, you can you can you can become a Buddhist, meditate against a wall for 30 years and maybe something will happen. Or, you know, you could take DMT and in 10 minutes you are in you're in Nirvana. Yeah. You know, so McKenna was a very important influence on me. I Mm -hmm. very much influenced by McKenna. And then I would say artistically, you know, there's a a Polish director, uh, Krzysztof, Krzysztof Kieslowski. He made the Three Colors Blue trilogy. Mm-hmm. I don't know if you remember that with Julia Binoche, those films. He had a big influence on me. Wow. Just at, from an aesthetic point of view. So those were at least be some of the, the, the major influences, I think, on I, the spiritual level. I love that. And I just, I just going back to your, your documentary, I just love the way it was filmed. I mean, you're obviously talking us today, to us today, and you narrated it. Like, just everything flowed so perfectly. Just the narration, the imagery, the um, transitions, all of it was just a beautiful, beautiful thing. Oh, thank you very much. Yes, absolutely. Um, so in terms of, I mean, you kind of covered this. And, you know, I never thought to not, to not do tarot for yourself, but the points that you brought up... Um, are really good ones that, you know, your, your ego at some point or another will step in that you can manipulate things to be what you want them to be. So like, how often do you recommend having a reading? Oh, I, I think it should be something in the Taoists talk about using the I Ching, you know, the mm-hmm. Chinese I Ching Oracle mm-hmm. only when you've gone, when you've, you're stuck, mm-hmm. you've fi- tried to figure it out. You've talked to people who understand whatever dilemma you're in. You've gotten mm-hmm. advice and you're still stuck as a last resort. Mm-hmm. Remember, the real tarot reading is life itself. Yes. In what, and and I, I don't want to sound too woo-woo-ish, but it's those archetypes are the building blocks of our consciousness. Mm-hmm. And there is, a, I, think, I think there's a real way to talk about how the universe emerges from consciousness. Mm-hmm. There's that idea that, you know, all, life emerged by accident and out of this accident of life emerges consciousness. Mm-hmm. That would be, I, I think, the mainstream view. The other view, the idealist view is from consciousness emerges this physical world. Yes. Everything has meaning. Mm-hmm. All, it's amazing, but everything does. So remember, life is, is your tarot reading. Mm-hmm. Using the tarot cards for divination especially if you're getting a reading, mm-hmm. I would be very careful every once in a while, every yeah. couple months, but wait till you're really stuck. Mm-hmm. The best readings come from people who are really tormented, mm-hmm. who are honest, mm-hmm. who are, are telling me, yeah, look, this is what's going on. Mm-hmm. And in those moments with a true dilemma, the, what the cards can do, they can really, not only can they help you guide you, They're Mm -hmm. never going to tell you the future. Yes. (laughs) They'll give you a hint and they'll never give you the hint you're hoping for. Mm -hmm. So like I, when I teach this, a lot of, I get a lot of people say, you know, is, is Johnny coming back or, you know, is whatever, are I going to get rich? And I tell them, if I could tell you that, would I be here? No, I'd be like doing tarot readings on your Google stock price tomorrow. Right. Yes. Yes. It doesn't, doesn't work that way. That's not the way the universe works. And that's not way divination divination just gives us hints, glimpses. And the most important thing it seems to, for me, it's the moment. Mm -hmm. It lets you know where we are in the moment. Yep. Because remember, it's a question as above, so below. So we ask this question, and we hope there's some synchronicity between the question and the way the cards fall. Mm-hmm. But that's telling us about right now. Mm-hmm. And there's sometimes a glimpse of the future, but it's it's just like a hint. Mm-hmm. It's just a hint. 
I love that because, you know, you think about it. I mean, of course, it would be nice to have a weather channel for our life. But, you know, <laughs> I like that. But, uh, but, you know, honestly, we would never come through the lessons that we were meant to learn if somebody gave us the answers. Part The answer is in the figuring. And exactly. how much would we miss out on if that was just handed to us on a silver platter? And that's tough for me because I'm a type A person. I'm very A, B, and C. Like, I need to know what's next. Like, don't have, um, I like controlled chaos. That's what I say. Controlled chaos is how I am. And um, just, you know, tell me, put me there. And whatever happens there is fine. But I want to know where I'm at. And I just think it's amazing with all of these things. And, you know, I used to worry about, well, what if I picked the wrong card? You're not going to pick the wrong card. The universe is going to push to you what it wants you to have. And it's just all really cool because all of these things that you have in your mind that are just human programs quickly subside with all of this stuff, I think. And, I, you know, now this is a question. That, that, I mean, that I'm talking now a little bit over my head, but there does seem to be from physics an idea that time is how we experience, but it's, it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's an artificial concept. Yes. So it's like seeing we see this picture and then that picture and then that picture. We're experiencing this way, and and out of that emerges an arrow of time. No, you mm -hmm. can't connect time to entropy and in these things. But in a sense, in a very deep sense, it all has happened. Mm -hmm. Yes, timelines on top of each other. Yes. And so when we say we're affecting the future, yeah, I mean. I, I think it, I really think if in the end we're going to see that it all is there and it all has happened mm -hmm. and somehow we're experiencing it in a way that gives us a sense of moving in a direction. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure we really are. Yeah. And that when you look at it that way, you, it takes a little of the fear out of it because mm -hmm. yeah, it's already I mean, happened. You And yeah. the thing is, now this does sound woo woo, but I'm convinced of it. Deep, deep down, we know. Mm -hmm. rarely is anyone shocked what I tell them. And sometimes yeah. you'll get really accurate readings. The cards confirm so many things and you see people go, and it happens to the reader too. It connects you. You're like, wow. And then you get something that they were looking for the answer kind mm -hmm. of. Mm -hmm. And it's amazing that they're never surprised. They always no. know. Mm hmm you and know, I they think... call you up and they say, I'm so in love with Johnny. I just got to be with him. And then it's like, you know, Johnny's with Susie. He's not with you. And they yeah. go, yeah, I knew. Shit, <laughs> They're like, I knew, I knew. Yeah, I know. It's amazing how 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 we know. Deep mm -hmm. down, we know. Mm -hmm. Remember, it's. I think it was Plato that said it's It's about remembering. Yes. Yep. It's not I actually so much have about that learning. quote on my wall. Yep. Yeah. And it's funny because, you know, with consciousness, I think that we know these things and that our intuition can kicks in because it's all essentially one kind of like what you were talking about how things don't create consciousness consciousness creates things and whether you yeah. believe this to be a holographic universe or whatever you believe it all is going to thread to each other because it all has the same source so that's the and that's exactly what you were saying that you kind of lose whatever concept of fear that you have after you figure that out because to me, there's only two things in life that are real, and that's love and fear. And everything stems from one or the other. I feel like you can root all of them back to one or the other. And when you realize that fear is created by us, that and you don't have to subscribe to that, it totally changes your life. Like I used to be mortified to walk out my back door and be in the dark, in the woods. Used to scare the life out of me. Now I'm just like, I'm energy. If something gets me, I'm going to be energy tomorrow. I'm going to be energy today. Like yeah. I'm just going to be a different form of energy. So what is there to fear? And when you adopt that way of thinking, I think your life radically changes. Absolutely. And, and like you said, the two things of, of, of the two, you know, what is it in a Corinthians uh, 13, mm -hmm. you know, where they talk about a divination and seeing the future, mm -hmm. but all divination will be, partial mm -hmm. but love will be eternal yes i actually have that i have i have that over the card so just when i read it it to humble me to understand mm -hmm. that you can do great readings and you can see whatever you want to see but it'll always be imperfect and our knowledge will always be imperfect mm -hmm. but we we can love in not maybe a perfect way but 
almost a perfect way. Yes. It's pure. And that should trump all of this stuff. Yes. If you get into this trying to get rich or trying to do weird stuff to people, mm -hmm. do it with love. Mm -hmm. And then even if you make a mistake, which you're going to make tons of mistakes, no one re is a perfect reader. But if mm -hmm. you do it with, with a sense of love for other people and really trying to help them, it, you'd be surprised how it all kind of begins to click a little bit more. But you're yeah. right. That's the key. That's I love that. the baseline. And I just love, I love spiritual maturity because I, I'll tell you when I first started manifesting, when I start, first started that practice of manifesting, my asks and wants were extremely superficial and, you know, like to the point where, you know, I want, you know, rich and fame kind of thing. And, and that now that is the very last thing I would ever want. I just want my needs for that day to be, co be covered. And yeah. I think that you become more emotionally, spiritually mature. So your asks change. And I really think that's what it's all about is getting you to the ultimate version of yourself where you don't want the things of the world, where you really all you want for the world is love and peace and for people to be decent people to each other. A absolutely. And remember, I would say also the questions you ask, mm -hmm. the quality of the questions that you confront yourself with mm -hmm. really determines the quality of your life. Mm -hmm. I love that. That's perfect. And, and, it, and it, it's so true. I was just talking to someone just now, just to say an influential person mm -hmm. with a considerable amount of, of prestige and money and, and whatnot. And we were talking about the whole concept of money and how it's so frustrating. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't get you. And it's not bad because wanting money and wanting security, these are normal things. Yes. We all want money and security. But if it becomes a fetish. Mm hmm you completely lose all perspective. You have to mm -hmm. be comfortable with insecurity. I mean, it's mm -hmm. okay to have some security and I, I, I think it's great, but you got to be comfortable with the insecurity because that's where all the fun is. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> love great. that. Yes. That's so perfect. And the funny thing with money is even when you achieve it, once you get there, you'll find something else to be insecure about. It doesn't Absolutely. alleviate anything. So. Yeah. And if you can be comf be comfortable with insecurity, mm -hmm. I think it's a more natural way of living. Mm -hmm. Then you, then of course, you're going to need money and you're going to want to make money. But, you know, you understand that it's, it's, it's not the end all. The end all is the experience of, of wonder, yep. of the mystical, no? Yep. Yeah, because you can't take it to you with your grave. So it's going to exactly. sit right there in that account that it's in. <laughs> That's awesome. Well, Robert, please tell us where everybody can find you, where they can get your work, help support you. Sure. <clears throat> On the YouTube channel, um, just put into YouTube uh, the 21 Faces of God. Mm -hmm. And you can see the entire documentary in long form. Mm -hmm. So there's a long form version or I've broken it up into 27 parts. So you can watch mm -hmm. it little by little. Mm -hmm. Most people seem to enjoy the long form version. That's I don't know what why. I watched. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I have a website, thecactusland.com. That has a lot of my articles. I've written on all sorts of things, politics, economics, esoteric topics, and all that stuff. And I also have a website, tarotjourneys.org. If you're interested in a reading, I do readings. They're not too expensive, $50. It's mm -hmm. about an hour. Mm -hmm. We look at your, your astrology chart for about 10, 15 minutes, just a general overview. Mm -hmm. Like I said, I don't do health questions. I prefer dilemmas. Mm -hmm. And then we, we do the reading, we go through it, and it's, it's used for a lot of people. It's, it's a great experience. So if awesome. you're interested in that, it's tarotjourneys.org. Awesome. Well, Robert, thank you so much for being here today. It was a pleasure speaking with you. Your work is fascinating. I encourage everybody to get out there and check you out and, of course, watch the documentary. It was so informational, and I think that for somebody that has no concept of any of this, it's a great starting point. Thanks Thank a lot. You, Thanks for having me on. Appreciate it. Take care. Have a great day. You too. Bye-bye.